America Looks Abroad. This is the 44th in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association. Today's subject is Japan's aims in Indochina. The speaker is Mr. T.A. Bisson, Foreign Policy Association expert who follows events in the Far East. Mr. Bisson. Good afternoon. A week ago, at 3 o'clock last Sunday afternoon, French and Japanese military commanders signed a pact at Hanoi in Indochina. Two days ago, on Friday, Germany, Japan, and Italy signed another pact at Berlin. The first pact entrenched Japanese military power in Indochina. The second tied Japan to the Berlin-Rome axis. In the Berlin pact, Germany and Italy recognized Japan's leadership in establishing a new order in Greater East Asia. Japan, in turn, recognizes the leadership of Germany and Italy in the creation of a new order in Europe. The important fact about these reciprocal pledges is that Germany is giving Japan a free hand in Southeast Asia. Greater East Asia is a term recently coined by Tokyo. It includes both French Indochina and the Dutch East Indies, whose mother countries have been conquered by Hitler. The Nazi title to these rich colonial possessions is now transferred to Japan by the terms of the Berlin Pact. The principal article of the new pact proclaims a military alliance between Germany, Japan, and Italy. The three powers agree to support each other by all economic, political, and military means should they be attacked by any power not involved in the European or Sino-Japanese war. The Berlin Agreement also includes an escape clause with regard to the Soviet Union. It declares that the terms of the pact do not affect the political status which now exists between any of the three signatories and the Soviet Union. The effect of this clause is to suggest that the pact is mainly directed against the United States. On the other hand, there are no signs of enthusiasm at Moscow over the new pact. Its text was printed in the Moscow papers without comment. The official Soviet attitude toward the pact has not been disclosed. It is not known even whether Moscow was consulted before the pact was concluded and announced. The Soviet Union's geographical position makes its attitude crucial. The next objective of German diplomacy, it is already clear, is to arrange an understanding between Japan and the Soviet Union. Official reactions from Washington have displayed considerable reserve and caution since the Berlin Pact was announced. On Friday, Secretary Hull declared that the agreement signed at Berlin was not unexpected and that the American government had previously taken it fully into account in determining this country's policy. President Roosevelt made no direct reference to the new alliance in a brief speech delivered yesterday in Washington. Sumner Wells, the Undersecretary under of State, dealt with the issue in general terms during an address at Cleveland yesterday. A Pacific solution of Far Eastern problems, he said, was still possible through sincere negotiations by all powers. But the United States was now preparing for all eventualities. Semi-official sources indicated that Washington was canvassing various methods of countering the Berlin Pact, increased aid to Britain and China, an extension of the embargo on shipments of American war materials to Japan, and an effort to improve relations with the Soviet Union were all suggested as possible lines of action that were under consideration. Lawrence A. Steinhardt, American ambassador at Moscow, has just returned to the Soviet capital after an absence of four months. From London come reports that the Burma Road may soon be reopened to permit supplies to be sent into China. Yielding to Japanese pressure, Britain closed the Burma Road last July 18th for a period of three months. This agreement expires on the 18th of next month but it is now said that the road may be re reopened before then. The same reports from London indicate that an Anglo-American-Australian defense agreement permitting use by the American Navy of Singapore and other British bases in the Pacific is expected to be reached shortly. Conclusion of the Berlin Pact is closely connected with recent developments in Indochina. Early this month, Tokyo was vigorously pressing its demands at Hanoi, with reports that Japanese officers had presented an ultimatum to the French officials there. On September 3rd, announcement of the British-American deal on destroyers and bases was made. This strong evidence of Anglo-American cooperation was immediately extended to the Far East. On the following day, Secretary Hull 
declared that if reports of a Japanese ultimatum to the Hanoi authorities proved well-founded, the effect upon public opinion in the United States would be unfortunate. Lord Halifax, British Foreign Secretary, made a statement on Indochina in the House of Lords, while the British and American ambassadors delivered formal representations at Tokyo. There were also emphatic indications from Washington that the United States intended to keep the American fleet in the Pacific. Finally, on September 5th, Secretary Hull conferred at Washington with the British ambassador and the Australian minister, suggesting that concerted measures in the Pacific were under consideration. These carefully timed and closely coordinated moves apparently had their effect in Tokyo, and the Japanese pressure at Hanoi temporarily relaxed. During the next two weeks, Secretary had Hull had several further conversations with the British ambassador and the Australian minister. By mid-September, it had become known that these talks involved consideration of possible use by the United States of British naval and air bases in the Pacific, including Singapore. From Tokyo came warnings against this growing measure of British-American collaboration in the Far East. On September 19th, an imperial conference met at Tokyo. These conferences, in which the emperor meets personally with his highest officials, have occurred rarely in Japanese history. They always meet to consider matters of the highest importance. The imperial conference of September 19th, it is now known, met to ratify the new alliance. Three days later, or last Sunday, the Indochina Indo Pact between France and Japan was announced at Hanoi. The situation which existed in Indochina undoubtedly helped Germany win Japan to the alliance. Germany could signify its good intentions toward Japan by offering to surrender its claim to Indochina, and then to make this offer concrete by bringing pressure on the French government at Vichy to yield to Japan's demands. Here was tangible evidence to Tokyo that Germany recognized Greater East Asia as a Japanese sphere of influence. The Hanoi Pact gave the Japanese the right to establish three air bases, garrisoned by 6,000 of their troops in the northern part of the French colony. It was apparently provided that these troops should enter Indochina by way of Haiphong, the main seaport. The agreement was hardly signed when a Japanese force moved across Indochina's northeastern border. French colonial troops on the spot resisted this advance. Hostilities thus begun seem to have continued, with the French forces being gradually driven back on Hanoi. For a time, it was thought that these hostilities had led to cancellation of the pact. On Thursday, however, 2,000 Japanese troops landed without opposition near Haiphong and were led to quarters provided by the French under the terms of the pact. It remains to be seen whether this peculiar Japanese occupation of Indochina, both by invasion and by agreement, is to continue. When the Hanoi Pact was proclaimed, the Indochina authorities declared that the mili military facilities granted Japan were in exchange for Japanese guarantees to respect the territorial integrity of the colony. The Japanese invasion across Indochina's northern border has already belied this pledge. The expressed belief of the Hanoi authorities that the colony's t integrity can be maintained is thus open to serious question. Even the concessions made in the pact, apart from the invasion, represent a formidable entering wedge. First 6,000 Japanese troops are admitted. Then three air bases are established. After that, the French may find it impossible to resist additional encroachments. Tokyo will be spurred, moreover, by powerful incentives to convert its partial occupation into full control. Japan's aims in Indochina are threefold, to dispose of the colony's economic resources, to secure a base for operations against China, and to obtain a base for further expansion into Southeast Asia. The air bases in northern Indochina will provide somewhat better possibilities of carrying the Japanese air attack into China's southwest, but air offensives alone are not likely to prove decisive. The difficulties of a Japanese drive into Indochina, into China, in fact, are extremely formidable. The terrain is highly mountainous. The Chinese can easily destroy the many tunnels and bridges along the railway leading into Yunnan province. These difficulties are so great that many qualified observers do not believe that Japan would primarily utilize the colony as a base for attack on China. China, indeed, may strike first and place the Japanese on the defensive. Japan's third aim in Indochina, perhaps its paramount aim, is to convert the colony into a base for expansion into Southeast Asia, toward Siam, British Malaya, 
and the Dutch East Indies. Japanese control of Indochina would lead to pressure on Siam and might conceivably open up the railway leading down the Malayan Peninsula. At the end of that peninsula lies Singapore. Naval bases in Indochina would also be of great assistance to Japan's moves in Southeast Asia. Announcement of the Hanoi Pact last Sunday led to a further series of steps in Washington. On Monday, Secretary Hull expressed disapproval of Japan's action. He noted that in Indochina, the status quo is being upset and that this is being achieved under duress and declared that the United States had repeatedly stated its position in disapproval and deprecation of such procedures. On Wednesday, the Export-Import Bank announced that a new loan of $25 million was being advanced to China and that the United States would obtain $30 million worth of tungsten from China. This was the third of such loans to China, although there was one important difference between this and the earlier loans. This one was an outright loan for Chinese currency stabilization purposes. The earlier loans in December 38 and March 1940 had stipulated that China must use the credits to purchase American products. On Thursday of this week, a third step was taken at Washington. The president issued orders prohibiting the export of iron and steel scrap, effective October 16th, with but two exceptions, the countries of the Western Hemisphere and Great Britain. This was the second embargo ruling which affected Japan, the first involving aviation gasoline, having been applied on July 31st. By exempting Britain, it clearly singled out Japan. On the other hand, the delay until October 16th was seen as holding out to Japan the possibility of a retreat on the Indochina issue. Any likelihood of such an outcome, however, disappeared on Friday with announcement of the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo Pact. Under the new creations thus created, under the new conditions thus created, a reappraisal of American policy in the Pacific is required. Less than ever does it seem possible that any kind of a compromise can be reached with Japan. Appeasement has failed in the Far East, as it has failed in Europe. The cards which the United States still holds in the Far East are strong if they can be skillfully played. China stands out even more clearly as the first line of American defense in the Pacific. The bulk of Japan's military and economic resources is already engaged in the effort to subjugate China. Here lies the Achilles heel of Japan's present position. The United States can reinforce China further with money, with materials, and by additional limitations on Japan's purchases in the American market. The major division of American opinion will probably arise over the question of the United States fleet. Should it be kept at Hawaii, sent to Singapore, or recalled to the Atlantic? The new allies, Germany, Italy, and Japan, cannot affect actual military naval contact at present. To this extent, their cooperation is limited and even involves an element of bluff. Only the Soviet Union offers the possibility of an immediate contact between Germany and Japan. Both Germany and Japan will undoubtedly make a determined effort to win Soviet support. Yet the Soviet Union's interest in maintaining China's resistance to Japanese encroachment should give American diplomacy in this sphere a distinct advantage over Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Mr. T.A. Bisson, Research Associate of the Foreign Policy Association. If you would like a free copy of this talk, send your request to the Foreign Policy Association, 22 East 38th Street, New York City. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world happenings. In the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Looks Abroad series as presented by the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. Mm -hmm.